All right. Good morning, everybody. I am going to let you do more of the work today than me, because some of you are are very apt and able to do this also. I'm just going to prime the pump, and then we're going to split off into some groups, and, and you guys can uh, work with each other. The first session we dealt, first and second session, I think we dealt with leadership styles, managerial versus servant. Does anybody need that handout? There's a couple of them here. If they're needed, hand those around. And then the first application we made was uh, as a wife. This came from the survey I took from our own church people. As a wife, what do you need from your husband? We did that one uh, before Dale came in November. Anybody need copies of that? Okay. We got a few of those up here also. Whoever needs one, feel free to grab one. So let's prime the pump here a little bit. <clears throat> Remember the basic difference, where this is kind of just review. The basic difference between managerial style of leadership versus servant style. And these are the two basic styles of leadership. Whether it's in the family, whether it's at work, it, it doesn't make much difference. They are the two basic styles. Um, managerial is more of a few people make the decisions and they don't care what the input is from down below. Or they ignore it. They say they care, but they ignore it or whatever. Um, servant style is everybody's input counts. Um, managerial style decisions are passed down and enforced. I'm on page five since you got that up there anyway. Um, they're made at the top and they come down kind of like commands and orders. In servant style, everyone participates. Um, so there's one is kind of, I'm in charge, I'll tell you what to do, and then I'll go do my own thing, you figure it out. The other is, I'm going to be involved with you, I'm going to help you, I want your input. That's just kind of rule of thumb, difference between the two. Um, and we won't go back over that, but I want you to remember that because many times as men, for instance, I, I talked about the fact when I grew up, I they called it servant leadership because that's what scripture calls it. You know, greatest among you must be your servant. So they called it servant leadership, but in reality it was managerial style leadership because we told you what to do and we're doing that to help you because we're trying to serve you. So let me tell you what to do and then you go do it. <laughs> it's like, no, that's managerial style leadership. That's not servant. Servant is help me, show me. Don't just give me orders. Uh, so I grew up thinking I was, you know, I, I came into adulthood thinking I was a servant leader. <laughs> and I was actually more from the managerial side. That didn't work good in the family. Because, you know, guys are known for being the fix-it people. So if something's not working, well, you just tell the wife how to do it and let her do it. <laughs> That's managerial style. And they don't appreciate that. They, you know. Well, just clean them up. They're a mess. Children, you know, children make a mess. Just clean them up, you know, take care of it. That's easy. And then we walk away and let them do it. Just discipline them. You take care of it. Just, you know, and we're just shouting commands and, well, what should I do with this? How do we handle this? Well, just do this. Just do that. That gets old in a marriage setting. Uh, servant leadership where, hey, something needs to be cleaned up, maybe help maybe and teach the kids and show them that you know when you do it this way it creates more work and actually be involved so we want servant leadership but we separated those two in the first session or two and uh, I think it's all recorded online so if you need to hear that you can go back and do it and uh, then we talked about <clears throat> I did a survey because I wanted to take those two styles of leadership and apply them mostly to family. And that's what I did in the first couple of sessions. Then we took a survey here with the ladies at church and we asked them uh, three questions. As a wife, what do you need from your husband? We went over that in November and talked about that. 
some. We're not going to go over it again unless you want to discuss it when you break up into groups, you can. The second one was, as a mother, as a mother, not a wife, but as a mother, what do you need from your husband? And the third one is, which we're not going to deal with today, it'll be the last session, because uh, next month we got uh, Kendall Qualls here, and then in April will be our last session. Our last session we're going to talk about, as a mother, what do your children need from your husband? from her perspective. So today we're going to look at, as a mother, what do you need from your husband? And we're going to talk about this a bit because it's, it's I want to give you a scripture here. It is uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 7. And I'm reading it out of the NIV. It says, husbands, <clears throat> in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life. So what we get from God, we inherit with her if we're married to her. Heirs, she's an heir with us of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. If our marriage is not good, if our relationship is not good, it messes with our prayers and our receiving the promises. It hinders them. It, it messes with it. So it's, it's good to do what we can to keep this on track. And I honestly believe that most Christian guys want to do that. We, you know, especially the bunch sitting here, the, the ones who are not interested in leading their wife or their family are probably the ones who, you know, would decide, I don't need that, blah, blah, blah. They got it all figured out. But, you know, especially us sitting here or who are here, we want to do this the right way. And sometimes we just need some other information to wrap our, our head and our spirit around because we've just seen it one way. Like, for instance, I grew up seeing managerial style of leadership. Um, my dad was a farmer. He worked, you know, farmer, rancher. He worked outside all day, every day. The only time he had some time where he wasn't outside was in the winter when it was too cold. Then he was in the house more. Um, I did not grow up my, seeing my dad do anything in the house because his philosophy was, I take care of everything outside. You take care of the house, okay? Okay. So that was his philosophy. So my dad never helped with dishes. My dad never vacuumed. He wasn't a messy man. He was a neat man. So it's not like he was scattered his stuff all over the house. But if, if one of the kids did or somebody else did, I never saw him help pick it up. He, he had more the managerial approach. He would give us commands. He'd give us orders. You guys need to get in there and clean that room. You guys need to get in there and fix that. You guys, you know, you know, and if we didn't know how, what was expected, we, we should ask and he'd tell us how, and then we'd go do it. He, he did not help us ever pick anything up or clean anything up or, um, you know, that world. He worked outside. So that was normal to me. So I wasn't a farmer, have never been a farmer since I married. But I brought that philosophy with. And, you know, as long as it's just the two of you and you don't have a bunch of children or a bunch of activity in the house, it's fairly easy for her to keep the house clean. But as children come and more activity comes and it gets more messy and, you know, well, then she wants help. Why would you want help? What's wrong with you? Guys don't help in the house. Because I had never seen it, never saw my dad do it, never saw any of my uncles, never saw my grandpa do it, never saw. They were purely, it was the woman's job, take care of the inside of the house. So as a result, I was in managerial leadership. Well, just do this, just do that, just take care of this. And I didn't even help with the commands. So I had to relearn some things, not because I wanted a bad marriage. I had to relearn some things because I just didn't know. 
And if I kept it this way, it was going to be a bad marriage. Um, Because she started saying, well, when did I become your slave? Well, you're not my slave. You're my wife. And that's what a wife does. (laughs) It's like, just keep digging the hole deeper, you know, (laughs) because I didn't know. So here we are as guys who want to have a good marriage, guys who, who want to improve our marriage. Some of us have good marriages and we want to improve our marriages. We just need information. The desire is already there. And one way to get information is like we did this, did the survey. And it's important to get the information because if we don't handle her correctly, as far as God's concerned, and I won't do a teaching on that verse. I'm just pointing it out. As far as God's concerned, if we don't handle her correctly, it's going to affect our results in prayer. We're going to get less prayer results. So here is number two. You want to grab one and pass it on? Here is the second question that we had on the survey which was, as a mother, what do you need? It's supposed to say your husband. It says you husband. Just make a mental note of that. Um, Oops, did I give you a, I told, did I pull the wrong one? As a wife, what do you need from your husband as a mother? Got the right one. Okay, we're good. It says this is the first question asked in the survey. Actually, this is the second. So there's two errors on this type up already. Uh, Below is a compilation of what was given. The rest should be correct. Number one, the first thing that was put on the list, 92.5% of the ladies in this church said, I want a a partner, I want someone to support me as a mother. Well, I would guess if I'd go around the room and say, "Did did we or are we supporting as a mother? You know, even when you have adult children, You still have to help them. You still get drug into this. You're a grandparent. You have adult children who need help, this, that, and the other. And and moms operate differently with them than guys do, typically speaking. Um, And they want support. They want help. Well, if I go around the room and say, do you support your wife in this? In with your children or your adult children or your grandchildren? Oh, yeah, I support. Every one of us would say we support them. But yet, that's their top request. 37 out of 40 of them, we had 40 people respond to the survey, said what they need is someone to give them support. They need a partner in this. Number two was 87%. They want encouragement, affirmation. In other words, tell her she's doing good. Tell the kids, hey, you guys are doing good, you know. Um Let them know that you're involved. Uh, To be present, connection. Well, what does that mean? I'm home every night after work. Well, that doesn't mean you're present. You can be home, but not be there and engaged. Uh, You can be off doing this, that, and the other, and you're not engaged with the the children, because as a mother, she needs you to help her with something here she wants you present so there's a number of things listed now some of us have some really good input on these and some of us we need more information so what we're going to do is we're going to break into groups and we're going to let you share on some of this stuff and you can pick whatever you want um integrity what does that mean What does a godly role model, a godly character look like? Some of you will have good information on that. Some of you won't. Discuss it. Figure it out. Let's talk about it. And let's glean from each other um, to be in unity with, with the wife. What does that mean? Well, in my marriage, it means just say nothing. Let her do her own thing. That's not unity. Well, I just tell her what to do, and she has to do it. That's not unity. She might not be in agreement. So how, how, how do you reach that in your life, especially those of you that have a good marriage? How do you reach unity with her, especially concerning things of children or grandchildren? Grandchildren can even be worse because they're grandchildren, and they get treated differently than the children did by far. 
<laughs> so how do you get in unity and get on the same page? How can you be a support? How can you be present? How, how do you do it? And what are some of the ideas and things that can be mixed back and forth on, okay, we can grow in this. We can change in this. Because I honestly believe all of us want what they're asking for. But maybe we just don't see ourselves. Maybe we just don't have the information. <laughs> so uh, work this through from a perspective of this is some of the stuff I've learned. This is some of the stuff I, I don't know how to, how to make a connection with my, my wife around our children. That can be adult children. You know, there doesn't have to be small children. It can be adult children. I, I don't know how to do that. Say that. And let some of the other guys give some of the ideas they have, and they might have a different question on a different point where they're going to say, I, I don't, to listen to my wife. She wants me to listen to her, especially concerning the children or the adult children. I just tune her out because when I listen to her, I disagree. And then we lose number one. We lose unity. So I, I don't know how to do that. Or I struggle. That's where we struggle. Well, let's talk about that. Let's discuss that in your groups then. And some, you know, everybody will have input on, hey, this is how we do it. Doesn't mean it always works. You might want to mention that if it works good or not. Uh, everybody will have some questions. But let's learn from each other on this. Okay? All right. Let's go to our groups. Let's so wandering around, it sounds like you had, you know, just poking in now and then it sounded like you all had some pretty good discussion that's good i'm glad you did um now i'm going to point something out to you and give you a homework assignment here is the one we did for the first week as a wife what do you need from your husband then today it was as a mother what do you need and once you grab once everybody's got those i want to point something out to you We'll wait until everybody's got it. There might need a few more on this side. If you could hand that other pile over, it would be great. So now if you take those and put them side by side, here's what I want you to see. Even though the points are not all in the same order, many of the points are the same. So what she's needing from us as a wife approach, she wants us to be her husband. The father is many of the same points. She's needing the same thing. So here's what I want you to see. How we're handling her, it might be in a different order but it's still the same issues because there are issues. It's not like we have this set of issues with the mom as our wife and this set of issues with the children. Totally different set of issues than we have with our marriage. No, they're all the same issues. They're just turned around a little bit in priority. So here's the homework assignment. <clears throat> Take those two, both of them, and uh, sit down with your wife and say, let's talk about these one at a time. How am I doing in unity or as a partner, supportive? I'm on the mother one now. As a mother, what do you need from your husband? How am I doing with that? How am I doing with being communicative, affirmative? And this might have been stuff you've already discussed. But as you go through those points, and then you can take the other one and go through them again, and like there's half of them or more are the same points. So it's not like you have to address 20 different things discuss them down from the perspective of how do how am i doing with you and how am i doing with the kids it's two applications but it's the same point if you don't have integrity with the wife chances are you don't have good integrity with the kids either follow my thought if you're not honest with the wife chances are you're not honest with the kids either and walk them down and just get her perspective. Now, we don't want this to turn into a full-blown fight. 
So don't defend yourself. You're just looking for information. You know, you're, you're, well, you can talk and ask questions and, you know, so how could I do it better? Give me an example. Talk to me. Um, and it doesn't have to be all at once in case it gets too heavy for you. You know, break it up. Do it two, three different times and hit three, four points now and then tomorrow or whatever we'll talk about next three, four. Um, but don't defend yourself. I am too honest. Well, uh, see, now you're going you're gonna to head into a fight. Don't go there. And for Isaiah, the best advice I can give you is hang on to this stuff. Because when you get married, well, actually, before you get married, these are the talking points between you and your prospective spouse. What are you looking for in communication? What are you looking for in leadership? What are you, and you get on the same page before you ever hit the trouble spots. Huge. If I, if I would have had these lists as a single young man going into marriage, do you know how much train wreck I could have avoided? How many bad days I wouldn't have had because it's like, what the heck did I marry her for? You know, kind of thing. I did. It really wasn't her fault. Of course, they've got issues too. They're they've they've got they're not perfect. So you bring their issues, combine them with my issues. It's like we can really have bad days. And if I'd have had more information like that, like well, she's looking for leadership. Well, let's discuss that rather than would you lead once in a while? I am leading, and here we go. You know, kind of thing. It would have made a difference. Even in um, pre-marriage counseling, you know, I mean, a lot of times when you, you, I don't know, you see all these kids, you know, going to pre-marriage counseling, they have no idea what questions to even talk about or ask. Yeah. And so these are questions to talk about. And even before you get into that pre-marriage counseling, talk to your spouse or your, yep. you know, your fiance about it. and. Make sure that you're on the same page before you even say, let's get married. Yep. So. Absolutely. Good first date question. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah. It is. <laughs> it, <is. laughs> it uh, you know, it, it, the premarital counseling, you know, we've got the series of, of messages they go through. But I've reached the point of, okay, we'll go through these and then let's get together. You take notes and we'll discuss any questions you have. And I have yet, they're, they're like 15 or 16 hours worth of messages we did. I have yet to have one come back and say, I have more than one question. It's like, how can you go through 15 hours worth of talking about marriage and you got no questions? Because they're in the, woo, life is wonderful and I'm getting married and we're in love and da 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 da. Here is the points that show up about six months later. All this stuff right here. And I'll tell them, okay, you listen to it all. Right now, most of it doesn't apply to you because you're never going to have those problems in your mind. <laughs> about six or eight months into it, we're getting back together. Now you're going to have questions. And the questions will revolve around all these points because they're all the same. You know, we think that our parenting issues are different than everybody else's no they're not they think our we think our marriage issues are different than anybody else's everybody's got the same issues they're just maybe in a little different order depending upon how what our information is but yeah absolutely i don't know if i pull it out on the first date but maybe the second <laughs> When, when you're talking about counseling, you know, for years as ministers, we really didn't have to do the counseling. And then we started, and it was really good. And AFCM had a good de deal that we had set up. <laughs> and I had, after Linda passed, I had one of her friends come and ask me if I would remarry him. He, he had a dated in high school, and then they kind of got separated and both got married to different people. And then they neither one worked. And after 20 years, they met at somebody else's wedding and started to, to gel back together. And so they come to, they says, well, you do a wedding ceremony for us. And I says, yeah, but I have to counsel you now. Well, they're 
40 years old. <laughs> and they both said, okay. We did the counseling and then did the ceremony. Everything went good. I seen him a couple, three years later, and I says, how are you guys doing? We're doing really well, but thank you for that counseling. One thing we both realized, if we'd have had that counseling the first time around, we probably could have still been married to our first in our first wedding. Yep. Yep. You know, so I thought, well, that's a compliment. Yep. You know. At 40 years old, by the time they came to you, they had questions. <laughs> yeah, we've been through this once and yeah. So my encouragement to you is don't shy away from talking about these. You know, I don't care if you've been married 59 years, it makes a difference. Don't shy away from talking about these and get the perspective of your wife, but don't defend yourself. Just gather information, ask questions. How could I do that better? How could I you know, don't ask the question. Well, so you're saying I'm a total failure? You know, don't bring up fighting words. <laughs> but ask questions and don't defend yourself. And let's see if we can actually make our marriages and how we're dealing with our families even that much better. Amen. So Lord, bless us to be able to do that. Give us the, the courage and the boldness to do that and the self-control to not get defensive and, and cop an attitude, but to act honestly, want to gather information where we can improve and grow. In Jesus' name, amen.